two, you probably remember that one of the pieces of the derivation of Lagrange's equations, the um, rule that was against having any velocity dependence in a potential was very strict. That is, if you did have that, then the whole thing broke down. Well, today we try to remedy that, and you have to, in order to do a Lagrangian of electromagnetic interactions. So when we do this, uh, we're going to be having to work with a vector potential as well as a scalar potential, and that's the way you get out of uh, that problem. So we'll still require that the scalar potential not have any velocity dependence, but the vector, it's, it's, up, it's all, all velocity. It's flow, okay, as we saw when we looked at the complex uh, variable um, sort of toy model for uh, vector scalar potentials. So we've got some technical work to get through this, and um, some mysteries will remain after we're uh, done with this, but the basic algebra, a little complicated, but um, I think very important because, well, it's what we see with it. Uh, very, uh, very much a, a part of our uh, physics life and action. Now, um, one of the things I have to help understand that is this machine that's sitting there, which I uh, made when I was at Georgia Tech. Um, this is a mechanical analog for a cyclotron, and we'll we'll play with it. But in case it breaks down, which is, it does, it's it's not engineered to a T. Um, I have lots of videos that we can use for quantitative purposes, and that's what we'll uh, be discussing uh, down here. But it occurred to me, just as I was putting this together again today, that um, the uh, <coughs> me mechanics, and all of this involves trajectories that are various kinds of cycloids, I thought it'd be better if we go toward the end of this lecture and do the mechanics, and that's what this stuff is on the sideboard here, uh, uh, right off the bat here. A and um, the reason for that, is, first of all, is basic sophomore physics. You've, you've had it, but we're looking at it with some little bit of geometry added. But al also, the mechanical analog depends on, on this. So I'm going to uh, jump ahead here on uh, this screen as well and get down to uh, basically the uh, flying sticks. Uh, you can see a picture of that. And this is something I'm asking you to do in your uh, problem sets as well. So we're going to zoom through this lecture until we get to the section describes the mechanics, but this right here. So um, what I'm doing here is setting up in as clear a way as possible uh, what happens when you have a stick sitting in space, no gravity or anything, uh, you're in an inertial frame, and you go up to that stick and you hit it somewhere. Okay? You get a very different set of curves uh, depending on where you hit it. The only thing that would be simple is if you hit it right on the center of gravity, then it would just take off in the direction of the gift, like that. But any other point on that stick, and it's going to rotate as well as translate. So this is where we think of a wheel uh, rolling on an imaginary road. That's the, the picture that I want you to, to get. It makes this uh, dynamics that we're seeing here. That's a qualitative picture, but it helps to have that in order to make the formulation of this uh, something that you can reproduce, uh, hopefully, on yourself someday later when you're teaching. Um, now, the idea of hitting the stick at a certain height above the center of gravity lets us um, quantify the fact that you've given it some linear momentum. That's whatever, uh, however much however much momentum that hammer has, it will be this thing we call Greek pi for linear momentum. But at the same time, 
you gave it some angular momentum. And this isn't something we've covered in great detail. We will do, it, we'll do more about that when we talk about orbits and things like that. The interplay between translation and rotation is, is a very deep one that leads into uh, special relativity, quantum mechanics, all sorts of things. But for now, it's just these two numbers we have to deal with. And, there, and there's really one number here. You gave some momentum, and then at the same time, depending on the height above the center of gravity, you gave it some angular momentum. So the question is, how much angular velocity does the thing have, and how much linear velocity does it have? And that's all there is to this little piece of classical mechanics that comes out of sophomore physics. Okay? So I want to make sure we go through that, because I'm going to use the same construction to build the cyclotron orbits of a crossed electric and magnetic field. Okay, and that's what this crazy classical uh, analog of a cyclotron uh, will be demonstrating. So, uh, first of all, let's remind ourselves of what's the moment of inertia, the rotational inertia of this thing, the integral of the density of the linear density of this uh, rod here uh, over r squared. That gives you the r q over 3, that's L, the length, this length at, at, at first here, uh, q over 3, and then mass is rho L. Now that would just be one uh, a half limit, but it isn't going to change this formula uh, here uh, if I put another half lever here, it's the same length, because then the mass is twice and uh, I take the 2 back out of the equation. I could put a whole bunch of them here. If they're all the same, this would be the equation. In, in either case, the mass would just keep getting bigger and bigger every time you stuck another lever on it, right? Okay, that's just a minor point, but it's, it's one that's uh, worth having. Okay, let's get uh, all this stuff on the uh, screens here. This is where we figure out the velocities. And um, I'll go ahead on the uh, screen down here as well. Okay, and then we want this magic point, this magic point that stands still. That's what we're looking for. And that's what we'll be looking for when we do uh, the analysis of the E cross B, the Hall effect uh, mechanics is what we're talking about here. And we're doing a lot of Hall effect uh, stuff down other labs in this building, so it's worth getting chummy with this kind of, uh, of, of mechanics. Now, um, here, I'm just saying, okay, if I uh, angular momentum here, the angular velocity, rather, uh, this uh, lambda of, of angular momentum that we've got here, h times the linear momentum, divided by this inertia that we've just calculated, okay, for a stick, uh, that's what you would get uh, for the angular velocity. And then this should be also equal to, uh, this is, after all, h and not Planck's constant, this is height, okay, uh, but uh, h times pi over i is what we're really talking about here. So with that, uh, I can figure out uh, where this magic point is, where this, the uh, speed, that's the distance from the center of gravity to, uh, here, just call it little p, uh, for radius uh, p omega due to the rotation of this thing uh, just cancels the translational speed and the translational speed measure of how fast the center of gravity, uh, center of gravity moves. You see? So these are time uh, pictures of, the, uh, of this uh, uh, stick that's been hit. So I think it's worth knowing that if you're in empty space and you have an object this is what it does. You hit it, it does something like this, no matter what shape or solidness it has. And later on we'll talk about solid figures, but this is the very first thing uh, to know about uh, that. So there's cyclides all over the place, right? That's a really common. And it's not just the uh, uh, cycloid, say, of the um, outer edge here. That's, that's a curlate cycloid, um, curl, sort of curls around. But the green one here comes down here 
its infinite curvature right at that point and then pops out of that with infinite curvature the other way and, and continues up its way up to here. So there's the ordinary cycloid that you've been working on in your homework. All the rest of them are attachments. Then they, the, uh, the, and this is prolate cycloids. Outside of their prolate cycloids, one of them that's really close to the center of gravity kind of looks just like a cosine or a sine curve. That's the yellow one, right? Okay. So the, 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 these uh, pieces of geometry are, are, are part of all of the motion, classical motion. And they are generating wave functions from there. When we do classical mechanics in that sort of a, uh, in, in, in a um, combined, combined a whole bunch of, of motions with the similar initial conditions, uh, we get that. Anyway, uh, the idea is to just solve for this, this magic distance right here. Okay. Now we've been talking about dynamics of levers for things like golf and tennis and baseball. Uh, it's very nice if you were holding the lever at that point. If you're holding a lever at that point and something hits it, or you're uh, moving it in order to hit a ball or whatever, okay, um, hitting it in the proper place is called a sweet spot. On a tennis racket, the sweet spot is pretty nebulous, they've designed a racket, so it, it, it's error forgiving. But uh, baseball, you really have to hit, and of course a golf club, you can't miss, uh, or you just miss the ball entirely. But um, the uh, idea is then that what happens, is what you would feel if you, if you think about it, is you feel the uh, uh, thing you're holding not go this way or that way or that way, you feel it to second order pulling out. And remember, that's what the cycloid does, the green uh, cycloid curve that is like this one, okay? There's another one that I haven't drawn here, starting right at this point here. So, it's just, you know, something to observe, something to think about uh, for this. In any case, uh, making uh, these equations, I'll go uh, just finish this uh, whole board uh, out here. Uh, I think uh, that's what we're after uh, right there. In this particular case, uh, the uh, formula for the percussion radius, okay, that, that's center of percussion point, COP, okay, that has no velocity after the hammer has made its uh, entry of momentum, both angular and linear. And in this case, that's the formula that gives you, uh, in terms of what you've already known, you presumably know the height that you've hit and the length of the lever uh, the, that you have. Okay, so I've got a problem I've given you to work that out just for the, the fun of it, and then go ahead and uh, draw a particular family of cycloids uh, that goes with this. Okay? So, this particular end, that's the end of the end of this uh, lecture, although the next step will be in really getting low in our things. We're going to the pool hall and figure out why they put the bumper at a particular height. How many people have seen what that is? Have you seen that in a, a course anywhere? Uh, how could they leave that out, right? What do you do after the physics class? Get out there shoot a whole pool, right? Okay, well, there's a reason for putting this bumper at a particular height. If we have time, we'll finish the discussion of that. But right now, I want to get into the hairy stuff uh, that we have uh, for today. So I'm going to uh, back the lecture all through all the stuff we're going to do today uh, to the very beginning where we talk about uh, just the basic idea point out we have some new stuff on here if you want to play with a complex variable thing we can start to do it a little bit uh, right now in any case if you, you, you um, if you are going to be a teacher in, in physics you're going to be teaching about the V cross B uh, uh, force right and the question is how do you remember well there's a thing called the right hand rule but what do you really mean by that and I've added something to that the right hand rule is obtained by taking the right hand, now it used to be that the 
right wing of the politi of politics was the FBI. It isn't true anymore. They're trying to get rid of the FBI. The right wing is trying to get rid of the FBI because it's discovering that people are doing bad things. So, uh, in any case, let's just pretend it's like the old days when the FBI was the right. Uh, so you take your right hand and you write FBI. And then you make a gun, which is, you know, uh, most of the FBI agents have to learn how to use one of those things. Okay? okay? But you, you hold your fingers like this. Okay? So I've got F here, I've got the B field here, and I've got the I of the current, that's positive current, right there. How can you go wrong? Okay, so this is what you check when you're seeing what what, what uh, is happening uh, to uh, a charge that is being moved through a B field. Now we're going to do all the algebra that goes with that. Okay, so let me uh, get this uh, one back uh, to the beginning here. And while I'm at it, I might as well see if I can do the same thing uh, with that one there. That's the wrong way. This is the right way, or backwards way. So we'll have us a, uh, a clean slate here to start with the uh, algebra. As you can see, it's somewhat formidable, all right? And there's some things that it's worth knowing about how you do uh, derivatives and uh, vector derivatives in, in particular uh, with um, this particular uh, Lagrange equation that we're going to get uh, for electric, electromagnetic field with an emphasis on uh, the magnetism because that's the new guy in town here. So uh, that's the, these are the basically Maxwell's equations in the, that, that's really all you need to get all the Maxwell equations just out of the potential scalar and vector uh, with that and everything kind of uh, follows from uh, these are the drivers you might say of uh, electromagnetic motion and it's a good idea to get familiar with that as much as possible. So this is the uh, F equal ma, the Newton uh, 2 equation written in the form that uh, you have a V cross B being the curl of A and then we have our good old minus, that's the physicist minus, we don't have a minus for that, we have a minus here though and that's very important because these two objects make a four vector for relativity. Um, later on, so this minus sign is, is to be respectful. Um, and then this partial derivative of A with respect to T, that's uh, 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 something that comes on uh, very, uh, very, in a very important way uh, later on. Okay, so let's get those uh, guys up there in a little bit more. The, the, the thing that I want to uh, waste a little bit of time with, but it's not a waste of time, I think a lot of people have trouble with this, uh, if you've learned your electromagnetism from Jackson, you've probably already done some of this because he uses both notation. The Gibbs notation with the fat letters and then something that involves their components. And then you end up with a cross product being described by something called the Levi-Civita uh, tensor, uh, the anti-symmetric tensor, epsilon, i, j, and k. Uh, a third rank tensor. Uh, and it's a uh, a beginning of uh, what we call exterior calculus. That's what comes out of vector and tensor analysis. Something we would like to do in this class, but we just don't have time. I've tried it several times. It's going to have to be pushed off to when you do gravity. Okay, and then you'll be working with these things all the time. One forms, two forms, and three forms, all that kind of stuff. But um, this is as close as we get to that in order to make uh, uh, this um, triple cross here, uh, how do you handle a triple cross that involves a differential operator, but also it's not trivial just to have another vector there of an ordinary kind. So uh, you have uh, the idea first that when you do a cross product, it's anti-symmetric. We didn't have to worry about that when we were doing a complex two-dimensional uh, A uh, uh, vector uh, potential. It was just uh, very much a cousin to the scalar, but now this guy's got three components and you get four all together to worry about, but right now we're just worrying about the three. So here we have a, a repeated sum here, epsilon 
K, K matches the K on this side. So I'm looking at the case component of the triple cross, and I'm asking you to sum over three numbers, that is x, y, and z, for first i, okay, so this i uh, right here goes with that one right there, and then the j goes with the uh, cross product, which itself, and here's a, a raw cross product of an operator, and we're going to write it as the a component of a little partial, because that's what the gradient has as, as a component. So there's three uh, components uh, for that and for that uh, that we can uh, make. So this is, is, is kind of a funny tensor uh, with nine components, three times three, and uh, they are all being summed. The A and the A and the B are being summed because they're repeated. Remember that thing about the dummy sum, uh, dummy index rule, okay? So uh, that is what we um, are going to uh, be playing with, and I want to. Um, and it's something you should practice on. It's not if you're if you're not familiar with this, uh, you need to uh, do some, uh, you know, a little bit on your own, study on your own uh, to do this kind of algebra. That's what we're we're really after here. Now, what we're going to apply since these two epsilons are sitting here in this equation, this one's summing over A and B, but it's also summing over the J right there, and then these two, the K and the I, are doing A sum as well. The I is anyway, and then the K belongs to the other side of the equation. But turning this into that is a key step. This is the Levitsevita. I think I'm pronouncing it pretty close to that. Um, uh, epsilon identity. The idea is that you're going to get zero most of the time, and that's because uh, this symbol, this thing, is sort of the opposite of the delta function. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever any two indices are equal, you're out of business. If any pair are equal, it just takes one pair, you're dead. So this tensor is pretty non-existent. It's only uh, equal to plus one if you have an even permutation of 1, 2, and 3, basically, or x, y, and z. Um, if you've got an odd permutation, it changes sign. So anytime you flip any two indices on this thing, you change its sign. So here are all six permutations of three things, three factorial permutations, 1, 2, 3. They're all even, 4, 5, and 6 are odd. So. Th th this is, is something that will take you not just in three space like we're working with uh, here, but it'll be good for uh, four dimensions, five, ten, you name it. Go do fancy Lie algebras. Uh, this guy's going to hop. Uh, is going to pop up. So uh, we turn this thing into, and what you do is you just say, okay, I'm going to take the first two indices, k. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm, I'm going to be taking the index I sum over here, and then I have ki and ab kind of left over. Okay, so the basic idea is that you get a plus if it's ka and ib, but you get a minus if it's kb and ia, the other, only other possibility uh, uh, for this product to give you something that's not zero. So that, that's it. That's, if you can just do that trick, then you don't have to pull your hair out trying to figure out what things like that are going to be. It is, it is a good path uh, to, to be aware of. Okay? And of course, these, these uh, exterior calculus things get much more complicated than what we're looking at right now. So then I go ahead and I put the two terms uh, uh, shown individually. Okay? And, and, have, and once you've done that, uh, you just reorganize. And that's what you get. You get this, this particular comment. In general, okay, and then you can rewrite it a number of different ways, but um, this is uh, an alternative to uh, remembering a lot of things that Gibbs. Gibbs is this guy, he's an American physicist, uh, at Yale, and uh, he decides that America's ignorant, and he's got to learn what's really going on in Europe, so he goes to Europe. 
We'll tell more about what he found in, later on as we discuss spinners or quaternions. That's what we'll really be doing when we uh, talk about resonance, which is the uh, next unit. And while I'm on that topic, I want to point out um, that I'm going to leave out a lecture. I'm going to leave out the lecture on constraints. I'm not going to give it. You're going to self-study that one. And I'll, there'll be a couple of simple problems to go with that. But um, what we're trying to do is get ahead so we can do some more connection to relativity and quantum mechanics at the end of this. So I'm cutting down on some of the uh, things. that you are pretty obvious. The, 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 the constraints uh, stuff is pretty obvious. Anyway, uh, Gibbs uh, uh, is the guy that discovered spinners. Uh, as he, did, he, he came from America and he discovered what had been done by Hamilton. And then he brought it back. And that's where you get the I, J, and K notation in your calculus book. It's from Gibbs. Talking to or seeing Hamilton's work. Okay, but there is a, a, a little caveat that goes with uh, all of these um, triple cross uh, businesses. Um, and that is Newtonian mechanics, and that's what we're doing here, but also the Hamilton mechanics that we'll get to uh, just a bit. Uh, we are going to say that the uh, partial derivative with respect to a coordinate k of velocity j for any k and j is identically zero. Those are independent variables for mechanics. So we're going to be leaving out this thing from this particular combination. That is a key thing. The gradient of v is identically zero. Now later on you make a field or something like that and give up on the mechanics, you're just studying the things in a raw form, then this not necessarily be something you would write. But for mechanics, it isn't. So this is a real sticking point. Uh, the, this business of dependency, and uh, dependency of independent. We, we, in mechanics, we pick initial condition, that's a position, and then we put an arrow on that, that's the initial velocity, right? And you can choose those anything you want, right? So they're not related by a, par a derivative formula. Okay, that, 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 that key idea I, I really want to emphasize. So, we got a big zero right here, okay? But you would normally have a little bit more if you did that. You'd have a gradient V in there. So this gets thrown out, okay? To do what we're going to do, uh, which is, is mechanics, uh, we have to uh, take that step uh, for sure. Okay? All right. Now, let's go through the algebra that we get after we've done that. It, this, this index notation uh, really helps you to distinguish between, say, something that's a gradient of a dot eva, da, 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 all those different things. Uh, you just write them out at, at, as components. Everything has an index. So you make tensors and vectors out of everything uh, in a notational way. So that. Um, and then we're, we, we, we say, okay, Gibbs, you're, you're, you've got a nice shorthand, but it screws you sometimes. So we're doing the stuff that's on the second line there. Okay? And that is, I think, uh, what we really um, be thankful for, uh, uh, for this particular uh, thing that we're about to do here. Okay? All right. Let's go ahead and do it. So this is the thing that uh, this turned into. There's two terms, but boy, they're, they're important terms. And um, we've got to make sure that they uh, behave and do what we can. So here's writing it out as a chain rule. Write, to, write those guys out uh, as a chain rule. That is, we're really talking about now a total time derivative of A. So that's going to be a partial with respect to X of whatever x velocity you have, a partial respect to y, whatever y, same for z. Okay, so we've got three terms right there. Plus, now we really have to take into account an explicit time dependence for a, because that's the laser. A laser is going to be coming in wiggling at some uh, 700 terahertz or something like that. So you got a big time derivative for almost all electromagnetic problems that what we do in quantum optics or whatever. So we basically have a v dot grad a 
it's sort of a flow term right there, if you will, and then Z partial A uh, with respect to time. So th this is very much a mechanics of things that are coming from the outside and making havoc out of the life of a, for a molecular atom, which we then use as a computer rating maybe someday. But uh, here's the mass times acceleration in its usual form. Move this guy over here so I have the gradients next to each other, and then I have this uh, little uh, partial, and then a V dot, right, a flowing term for the time behavior of this thing. Okay, and then we put them together in another way. Okay, so here, here's kind of where we stand just with respect to doing chain rules uh, to get these uh, gives fat vector notation uh, into shape. Now I start pulling the things apart a little bit here. Um, basically, I'm pointing out that what we were talking about here, remember when we uh, did our Lagrangian, we were thinking about partials with respect to velocity, the time derivative of that, and it was a partial with respect to velocity of kinetic energy, mv squared. This is three-dimensional kinetic energy uh, of a particle of mass m. Okay. So I'm pull pulling out of this thing um, also, the time derivative, that's the total time derivative uh, of this. Now, um, this, this equation here is pretty obvious, but there's also the fact that now I can deal uh, directly with this term right here. I put the charge on to the uh, EA and put it aside, and then get these gradient guys organized here, okay, as, uh, as they are, okay, and then uh, from the, from the other uh, part of this, the total derivative, remember, uh, <clears throat> we're talking about derivative of A, and then we've got the, the flowing part right there. So eventually, the whole idea of this is to put it together in a form that represents or resembles uh, the Lagrangian equations. This is where you sort of sit there and scratch your head and figure out uh, how do I make uh, this into uh, something that behaves like the Lagrangian equations. So uh, first thing uh, to do is notice that I can write this whole thing just as a partial with respect to the coordinate vector r. That's a gradient, but I'm rewriting it. Okay, and I've got here the kinetic energy, and I've got here this thing that has a potential in it, but also has a vector potential multiplied by the velocity, and that, that's the trick right there. Is this is in the form now of a Lagrangian uh, equation. Let me uh, go ahead and just write the thing here, and then you see, voila, okay? Abracadabra, we have made here a, uh, a Lagrangian uh, equation. We have a Lagrangian now. We have something, this thing, uh, that behaves like that. Okay. Now, this step here requires that um, we make use of that um, formula that says that r is an independent variable of velocity. So, you know, that, that, that it allows us to put it here, but it's not doing anything. It's giving zero. And that's a pretty neat trick right there. Okay, uh, let's see if um, anything else I can say. There, there at the very bottom of that uh, screen is what we're after. Okay, there, bottom line. This is the bottom line for the derivation of the electromagnetic Lagrangian and Hamiltonian in a minute. And uh, I'll put all that stuff together and see if we get Maxwell's equations, basically, uh, from that. Okay? All right. Um, so, canonical momentum. What the heck is that? Uh, canonical means that Pope is, is, is right. But what, what's the Pope doing here? Nothing. We've got to use old fashioned notation for this, uh, uh, this business. We've, called the momentum canonical a few times in this class. Now, well, maybe we kind of mean it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is what happens. Somehow, 
the, mom the momentum, and that is the, the, the part of the, of the motion that has to do with mass moving, gets mixed up with this, this guy, this, this uh, vector potential, this, this flow uh, associated with the vector potential somehow gets entangled or something uh, with the, uh, you know, stuff that we're kind of used to as just particle momentum. So we're really used to this, but what we're saying here is that the P that I've got here is this. It's, it's MV, all right, but you've got to add this thing in order to make it work. Well, that's what Lagrange tells you. That's uh, basically what's, what happens when I take the partial with respect to V of the thing that gave us Lagrange's equation. So this is uh, the bona fide uh, momentum uh, that we're going to have to deal with if we're going to get right with the, uh, get right with light. Okay, that's what we're doing here. We're getting right with light. We're getting electromagnetic uh, wave phenomena uh, to show us something. Uh, to but also uh, static B and E fields as well. But this is going to be good for relativistic bar mechanics, basically. The same darn thing we do uh, for it. We're doing here. Okay. So, this just says, if I don't have any field, any field that I have to worry about, well, then momentum is what you're used to. But uh, here, Boy, I, <laughs> they're always sawing wood around here. I guess it's winter time and getting the, the logs stacked up somewhere. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this Lagrangian uh, form, the usual form, L equal T minus V, was electric potential. But if uh, there's a magnetic uh, activity around anywhere, then you, you really do have to take account of everything that we've written down uh, here. And I'm going to go ahead and just finish this one. Uh, and talk about uh, what it is uh, that uh, we can call these things uh, that we're uh, writing down here. Okay. A not zero. This leads to what I would call extraordinary canonical momentum. That is, P is mv plus v a. Okay. Now um, I'm going to go ahead and solve it and say, well, if you want the particle momentum, that, that's the particle momentum, no question about that. Then you take the canonical momentum and you subtract the A. That, that's just the arithmetic that, that, that this is, is giving. So that's what we're going to have to do to make a Hamiltonian. In order to make a Hamiltonian, we're going to have to stick that uh, into uh, the Lagrangian uh, transformation, that is the Legendre transformation that takes us from uh, the Lagrangian, that is this very beautiful thing that we worked on in the, ver almost in the first week or so, uh, where we have a V dot P, well in our notation after we get tensorized, is the queer coordinates dot and then the queer momentum. Okay, this is a sum. I'm putting the sigma here just to remind you uh, that uh, the, the dummy sum rule uh, isn't always used in literature. But uh, when I go here and do a V dot P, now there's P with its the A that goes along with it now, and then we subtract the whole Lagrangian from that. Okay, that's the Legendre uh, uh, transformation from uh, the, the, the uh, Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian. But look what happens here. V dot A cancels a minus V dot A. But the Hamiltonian is just a scalar. The only thing that's left is a scalar. This sounds really crazy. What, what happened to the vector potential? Well, it's around, but it's not here. This is only correct numerically. This is a numerically correct equation. Like we've, when we've done this transformation before, right? We got something that's kind of weird. Um, but we're going to change that now and get it in terms of momentum, canonical momentum. And then we'll be off the races as so far as Hamilton's concerned. But still, we have this thing as a numerically correct equation. 
So we do have to uh, go ahead and say, you know, say a few words about that. But the basic idea is to replace uh, the the Hamiltonian has to be explicit function of this momentum that uh, we had uh, written down uh, before. So we're going to stick that in there. That that is definitely uh, what has to happen. V dot V is going to be uh, this P minus E A, if you feel an electric charge A uh, on the uh, thing, and then we're going to get uh, what we're really after uh, here, which is a Hamiltonian that supposedly will work, uh, whatever problem you do. So if you're going to do quantum mechanics, it's much harder uh, to build Lagrangians than it is the Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian kind of wins at first here, and uh, this, this is numerically and formally and differentially correct. And so you're going to be seeing momentum dot A's and you have to be careful. If you're going to use this for quantum mechanics, you have to realize that A has R in it, that's position. So I've got to keep the order here uh, because X and P don't commute if I'm going to do quantum mechanics. But we're not classical, so I'm just going to mix them up and get rid of the two here. <laughs> but uh, be aware. Uh, that that uh, is in, uh, is in the uh, cards, okay? So, question is, what do Hamilton's equations look like given this Hamilton, okay? We know what Hamilton's equations look like. We're just going to see if they give us something that makes sense. And that's the rest of this algebra here. Well, the first one isn't, isn't too tough. This one, the first you say, well, didn't I see this before? Isn't this what velocity came out to be, in essence, P minus E over A divided by E. Okay? You take a partial derivative of this thing with respect to P, and that's what you get. Okay? So this was Hamilton's second equation here. Now there's... Am I, am I right in saying that? Uh, yeah. Yes, I think so. So, um... Yeah. So, um... The... Basic idea is this just copies what we already know, or what we had to assume in order to make this work. Okay, and that's a key point here. But now we better get Maxwell's equations. We've got some more Hamilton equations to deal with. This this thing that we've just written down in index notation anyway uh, is the uh, uh, Hamilton's dp dt equation. Okay. So now, here, this thing, this is P dot now, this was R dot, this is the P dot equation, it has a minus sign in it. You check all this uh, on the wall, on the Hamilton, Hamilton section up there, okay, partial derivative, that's the first equation, H with respect to the momentum is velocity, and H with respect to the velocity is uh, minus uh, the momentum dot. Okay. So, what is this? Well, this is a bit of a mess, right? but um, it works out uh, pretty nicely. We have to be careful to do the derivatives, and we're working in component form. Doing this thing with Gibbs notation uh, will um, make you bald by ripping your hair. Out. Not get very far with this, but this is going to work. This thing right here is just going to bump B. Uh, this thing we recognize as the partial A the extra electric field uh, combination. So, what we will uh, find after we put all this together, and of course, we've had this equation uh, already, and we can keep this going on the other screens here. and take it to that point. And notice there's a cancellation of A dot. That is really key. That's very important. So you can make a sign there. Not have that happen, and you'll get a mess. But what you're getting now is this. And guess what that is? That's just M V dot equals... What the heck is that? Well, that's V cross P. Plus E, that's it, That's the uh, Newton's equation written out uh, 
using the uh, proper notation. Okay. So we've come full circle here, back to the equations that started that, uh, uh, the name for uh, uh, something that tells you how a velocity uh, of a mass uh, behaves is called a pondermontive equation. I mean, that, it just means push the mass. <laughs> um, th this, this thing right there is the basic definition of the force equal mass times acceleration. So that, that's virtually it for uh, getting uh, Lagrange and the Hamiltonian and checking them uh, out. Okay? All right, we're going to apply this now. Uh, the first thing that I want to uh, do is get the FBI rule out and get it exposed. But we'll do uh, very, the very simplest possible uh, electrodynamic mechanics uh, here. We're going to have a constant E field, that means that there will be a scalar potential field constant gradient, okay? That, that will be the thing that uh, we'll put down first. And uh, let's get that up here and up here. Try to keep these boards sync because we're going to have time to compare some things. And this will be the thing after we talk about the effect of the A, that's the, a, the thing that builds uh, the B field, if you're thinking of going from potential to field, uh, this is a rigid, this is a field that I had to do a problem with that involved the water being rigid. This A right here is going to be the velocity field on this mechanical angle. I mean, that's how crazy this is. But it isn't really so crazy if you think about it a while. Because the A field that you get, if you have a constant B field, is just B cross R over 2. Okay? So that's why this rigid rotor field corresponds to the vector potential. You actually have the vector potential exposing itself in an analog, mechanical analog. And then there's going to be both balls that roll on this thing without slipping and behave like a particle in a cyclotron. All right? Did you, when you came to class today, did you think you were going to see something as weird as this? I mean, this is weird. Okay? But vector potential is weird. We're used to scalar potential. It's kind of weird, too. But vector potential is what you get if you have a scalar potential and you run through it relativistically. All of a sudden, you're going to see A. And it's going to do stuff like this. Okay, so that's what we want to talk about. Uh, just in, this is the simplest possible uh, thing involving uh, those. Uh, and I'm not having any explicit time dependence of this, but we're uh, next unit, unit four, which will start on Monday, is resonance. And uh, cyclotron resonance this is why you make a cyclotron uh, to accelerate particles. It, it was the first particle accelerator. So, uh, thing. It, this is analogous to. Okay. So the equations of motion we have here are, are, are quite simple. Well, not simple enough that um, they're obvious ways to make a solution. What I want to do is use a shorthand notation <coughs> for these. First of all, that's the first thing. Get the notation uh, so it's fairly clean. And I don't have to drag the electric charge in the uh, mass around. Uh, in every equation I write, because we're going to be writing lots of these things over and over again. So I'm going to have a little epsilon x and an epsilon y uh, that means E over m, that famous ratio, the constant ratio I think is called electric charge over mass. Um, that co that's going to set the units that we're talking about uh, uh, here, that times the electric field. And we're going to use the same one on the uh, B field. And the B field is going to be all in the Z direction making this rotor and the electric field is going to be crossed with it, that is perpendicular to it. And we'll just take the X field eventually. And that's all that that machine can provide. It can make a table go like this. I have not been able to put something or make a table go like that in there. And you'll see why I didn't do that because it's really hard to control. <laughs> anyway, 
So the Gibbs notation would be something like this. And once again, I want to get away from Gibbs notation. I want to have a simple way to manipulate these equations, see what they're doing, uh, and um, you know, make the physics uh, understandable as, as much as possible. Okay? And that's where you bring in complex variables. This is why I made a fuss. One of the reasons I made a big fuss about uh, complex variables uh, in the uh, Unit 1, Chapter 10. So let's get all of the boards uh, reading uh, what we're after here. So when I take a complex variable velocity, all I'm going to do is make it complex by putting just one uh, as a component in front of this uh, x component and then an i in front of the y component. So I'm going to be writing each of my uh, two component things as a single number, which is a two component thing. It's got a real part and it's got an imaginary part. And we're going to play that game. We're going to go ahead and write the equation of motion uh, that way. That is, we're going to have an x component of the uh, velocity dot, that's an acceleration in the x direction, and then this is the acceleration in the y direction, being kept carried a single complex number in each case. So you see the velocity there, and then you've got the electric field right there, and then you've got the, the b number uh, on top of that. So, uh, this right here, this cross product is giving you a vx ey, that's the unit vector y, and this is a by unit vector x. Okay, so how does the complex take care of that? Well, it just puts the i, on, a minus i, on this one, and changes the. In other words, basically, this has to go down here if it's going to be in a place where you never put the imaginary part. In any case, this is the b. That's a real number times a complex number v. This is a complex number e for the electric field, and uh, there's the velocity dot. So. This is the equation we're working with now. That's simpler, right? We can take derivatives and angles of that thing until you're blue in the face, and it's easy uh, to write them all out. So that's what we're after here. Okay. So it's it's a, uh, a velocity uh, transformation that I find really useful is to uh, call something a big V if I add a number beta, which I can control, and we'll see uh, how that works. But the beta that I'm going to be adding to it is an imaginary number, the ratio of the electric field to the, to the B field. So let's get all of that uh, in place here. Now, one of the things that happens, of course, is that because we had a lot of space to set all this up, we're now out of space, so I've got to do like in those big lecture halls where you lift the boards, right? I've got to lift all this stuff up uh, for the next uh, 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 slide. So that, that's the lift up right there. There's that thing that uh, we had before, so you can compare and see the stuff at the, at the bottom is now uh, sitting right here. So this is the uh, equation for this pseudo-velocity. The velocity has an extra translation. Uh, added to it. Now the translation itself is complex, like everything here. This one happens to be imaginary, okay, with that epsilon. But the epsilon is complex, so that it is a complex number uh, sitting in every every practically every spot there. Okay, so here's what here's what we got to work on, All right? Now here here's the key thing. Remember I said that when you have an e to the i b t, well, when you have e to the i angle, you're doing a rotation on this complex number, right? e to the minus i b t, which is the one that you always get in the hammer, that's always left-handed, right? So we're talking about phaser now, right? Remember when we talked about phaser? Well, here I'm just saying I'm going to do a rotation of this velocity vector. That's going to be my solution, really, up to this uh, crust uh, electric and magnetic field a problem. Okay? And with a minus sign, it's a, com a clockwise, left-handed, uh, 2D rotation. Everything's 2D here, X and Y. Okay? 
So um, this is what we get uh, from that. We get that the uh, V is zero, and we remember that the V is zero is the uh, old velocity, uh, little v, uh, plus that translation that, that uh, uh, we've added. And remember, we're keeping the electric field and the magnetic field constant, so this is something that you're, uh, you're adding a constant to, uh, a, a, a dynamic quantity. Okay. And another way to write. So once we uh, get this done, this is the complex form, then we're going to translate it back to the real form. The real form is a matrix form. Okay. What we're seeing here is the velocity is equal to a rotation by the V of the big V, and the big V has got this extra uh, translation on it. You have to be sure uh, to add them with a Y here and a minus sign and an X here. That's what the complex numbers are telling you. And then the electric field is just straight off uh, a switch uh, to the Y. Uh, this time it's plus because we got a minus sign there, and then the X comes down with the minus sign not changing. So there it is. That's the solution for the velocity. We still have to integrate that. But we'll integrate this instead of that, or you can do it either way. At this point, we're uh, really close to having a really nice uh, geometrical solution uh, to cross B and E uh, field uh, motion. We need a coordinate. You actually get the coordinate now. Okay. So do an integral of that guy right there. Get some extra factors. Okay. And uh, get this constant, have a T on it, and then have an integration constant uh, left over. And we can actually calculate that as well. So this is the complex form uh, up to the coordinate. A solution that comes out of this uh, thing. And here it is being written out explicitly at the very bottom line of this page. And they're all the same now. Okay? So here is our, our x coordinate and our y coordinate. Now, of course, it'd be nice to just write that as a matrix too, just to uh, make things uh, think. But uh, again, I'm going to take my board and lift it, okay, uh, here both of these, uh, all three of them actually, and um, this is where we, we stand right now. There's the complex form uh, for the uh, coordinate x plus i, y, and um, now it's just a question of making some sense out of that. This is a rotation of something right here that involves initial conditions of the velocity and the electric field. This one just the electric field, but it's times time. And then here's the uh, just the static initial positions of this thing, and you have to have that uh, in order to get started uh, with the uh, motion that comes from x and y as a function of time. So let's lift this one up too. And now we're going to start drawing some pictures of this that make some geometrical sense. And this is something um, which I won't go uh, in order to avoid missing out on all of the demos that go with this lecture. I'm going to skirt through this. And this is where you would check your right hand rule to see that it's happening. But the basic thing that I'm going to put in the center board here is once again, we're going to have a generalized cycloid. That is, we're going to have a wheel that rolls on a highway like the um, wheel that the stick had after it got punched. And then uh, there was a center of percussion of, uh, uh, radius. That's going to be the radius of an actual. And this is this wheel is like the wheel you see on a railroad car, right? It has a flange, right? The flange is the thing that's making the curling cycloid. If I can uh, adjust these parameters here, I can get a, a, a pure cycloid by just somehow reducing the, uh, the rim to the radius of the wheel. Okay, so the basic idea of having a, uh, a wheel with a rim, and, and the, the thing that I'm referring to with the rim is RW, that turns out to be E over B squared, and um, 
the rest of it is, is pretty easy uh, to see after you've you know, played with. So something that you kind of have to do uh, yourself uh, in order now, I've given a problem on this particular E cross B uh, field motion, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm asking you to go ahead and uh, uh, plot a few of these uh, cycloids, both the uh, curlate ones, but also some interesting prolate ones, which we'll see uh, as we get to play with this some more. Okay, so you're going to get curves kind of like that. This is drawn by an old program. We have a brand new program that's working really well. That TC's put built out of the old one. It's called Coolit, C-O-U-L, because it mostly is dealing with Coulomb fields, but not exclusively. You can deal with uh, other things. And this is the uh, control uh, panel that goes with that. And um, I will just briefly uh, show uh, that, uh, just to give you an idea uh, what is involved uh, with it. I think we might do it on the center screen. And let me get the uh, last screen here up. Not that one. Keep that one where it is. Uh, this one up to, to uh, uh, speed. Now, um, you can see on the left-hand side there are a lot of things that you can change. We're doing a Stark versus Zeeman field. That's the name the physicists give to electric fields and to magnetic fields respectively. But um, with this particular one, what I'm going to do right away, uh, before we get into the fancy stuff, is I'm going to get rid of the, the check here for uh, plotting the, uh, this, what we call the uh, swarm. Uh, this thing right here, do swarm, okay. I'm going to uncheck that. Um, basically, uh, you'll see what that does. Is it puts out a whole bunch of particles like we did when we had the, uh, the uh, volcanoes of EO, right? We had a bunch of trajectories go out. I'm going to do the same thing here. That's really beautiful. But let's just do one just to see what's the basic properties of these uh, things. And I'm going to make the number of burst paths equal to one. Uh, that means one trajectory like that. And then, of course, you can set the initial conditions, but the best way to do that is just to click on the screen. Once the uh, anim animation is working, and uh, I'm going to try to make it work uh, right now, uh, let's just get it going here. Okay. And there's a typical cycle. It goes up there, infinite curvature, and then infinite curvature with the opposite sign. That's what's going on in the little peaks there. Okay. And to uh, have th that, uh, right now it's just doing one particle out of the swarm, but what I want to do here is I want to go ahead and turn the swarm off. And I also want to turn the electric field off for uh, the time being. So I'm going to go get the uh, electric field here. One more That's down. the Z field right here. Okay, I think the best way to get rid of that uh, for sure is to do a zero. Right? Okay, so th that gets that to happen. And then I should be free to set my initial conditions out here. Now I have a, Z, a B field of one. Okay, and that's kind of what is on your problem. Uh, I just took units uh, to make things easy here. But I'm just going to go here and um, plot something uh, with a velocity, uh, say, uh, this way. Okay, that's the way you set the uh, momentum. And what do I get? I get a phaser. Oh, wow. <laughs> Another phaser. Okay, these trajectories are nothing but phasers without the uh, electric field. Right? No matter where I go, and you've probably seen uh, pictures of bubble chambers, which have a bunch of little circles. These are their spirals because there's loss. We don't have any friction here. But basically, that's all this thing can do in a magnetic field, is just go around in a, con a, a clockwise circle. No matter where you start, no matter how you throw it, I can throw it up, and it'll go around that circle. I can throw it down, it'll go around that circle. You see? No matter where I go, it just makes a circle out of everything. That's all you get. Okay? All right, that's kind of neat. Now, uh, 
what I want to do now is go ahead and turn that electric field on, and I forget what it was that was before I, t I turned it off. That's this guy right here. One up. You're real close. There you are. Um, and I forget what the number was. I could look it up right here, I think, electric field, 0 0.1 with a minus sign. So what this could be, and that's what it is in your problem, could be gravity. Okay, gravity's down, so we're going to put a minus 0.1 on the electric field. We're going to let, it, let that be the driving force. I mean, how does this thing know? Uh, it, it is the mass uh, working on it. So I'm going to try to make uh, the electric field be minus 0.1. It means I have to get a little closer to the center there. And I probably ought to just go and uh, click this number right here. We still don't have the best of all controls for numbers uh, that you can have. But th there's uh, where I have the field that we've got. Now, now when I click on this thing... You shifted to Zeeman accidentally. Pardon? You shifted the Zeeman field accidentally. Oh dear. Uh, something dragged across it. And okay, let me get rid of the... That's the one? I want to have that be plus one. Right. Okay. Uh, let me... Uh, I'm pushing on the wrong uh, computer here. Okay. There, that should be uh, what uh, we get. And, and where's my uh, start field? What happened to it? You're still good. One more down, you can oh, see that, it. That's it. Minus point 0.1 in the y direction. Okay, so I start off here, I get my cycloid. Okay, now all I, that's all I can make. And it's getting kind of cluttered here. So uh, let's go ahead and bring the uh, thing down where I can erase paths. Let's start over. Okay, so this time I'm going to throw the particle uh, a little bit to the left. Okay? And that's what I want you to find, or close to that. This is gravity, and this is what the particle does. It never falls. Well, it falls a little bit and hops back up here. If I was really perfect with that number that I uh, put in there for velocity, I could make things go a straight line. Okay, so that's a pretty really simple trajectory that this thing does. Okay? If I, I throw it the other way, like this, I get curly tail. I still follow the line at some points, right? And no matter where I throw the thing, I still intersect with that thing uh, at a, a particular uh, place, okay? So at this point, it's worthwhile studying the swarms, okay? And so I'm going to go back down here and turn on the swarm. And then the question is, how many particles do I want to have? I'm going to have a 24, OK? So I just click here. Isn't that beautiful? So this is, these are the things you can make with this. Can't do that with that thing down there. But this is what's going on. And if the swarm is, is you know, really tight, and I, uh, I color it according to Lagrangian, I get uh, the wave functions for E cross B. Okay, that, that's uh, something you should remember from this course. That's the semi-classical way uh, that uh, Rick Heller uh, talks about. Okay? All right. I think we've uh, said enough. It's about time for us to hurry up a little bit here, or we're going to be... Uh, way over time, and, and so what I'm going to do is take us back uh, to the lecture, and uh, there's a, a, a pretty good example of uh, what uh, we, we can make uh, with the uh, thing. We just did something like that. But here's the mechanical analog, and I'm going to sort of zoom <coughs> through this thing a little bit, but what we're dealing with here is a ball rolling on a table and not slipping. That's the hard part, is to get some lucite that's really clean, a, a, a billiard ball that's really round, and not have any dust particles. So every time there's a dust particle, it, bounces, it slips a little bit. So we, we, we have, you know, trying to make something really ideal here, and we're going to be um, turning this thing at a certain rate, and that rate is going to be the B field. 
Uh, that's going to determine the B field and the A field. The A field actually is in the plane, uh, as we've already mentioned, uh, is uh, this thing is doing. So uh, let's get all of this uh, thing. Now, at some point, probably going to just have to run the movie uh, to see it, and then we can, if you want to stick around and play with the actual machine, uh, you're welcome to do that. It's a lot of fun. And I think maybe somebody figure out an easy way to make a cheap one of those, it would be a, a neat game uh, for, uh, I mean, billiards is fun just with a flat and stationary table, but something like this, oh boy. Anyway, um, what, what we have to do in order to uh, take the equations of motion here and the, the basic idea of no slipping condition uh, it, is this. This is just straight on Gibbs type uh, uh, a notation. We're talking about uh, a translational force that has mass times velocity. We're talking about here uh, 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 the, the, the rotational torque that this thing is, is getting. F cross R, okay, and that is proportional to omega dot, omega being uh, up there uh, vertically up to this thing. Um, so Omega cross R is part of the velocity. That's really what um, makes this thing uh, move. But what you can see here, the mechanics of this thing is in some ways more complicated than the mechanics of the actual field that it's representing. And uh, I'm just going to put all of these things here together so you can see uh, what it finally comes out uh, uh, to be. This, this is a mechanical uh, cyclotron, as I said a couple of times already. Now what's neat is that this coefficient of the acceleration and then here is uh, B cross V. Remember the omega is a uh, thing that represents the actual B vector coming up uh, through the thing uh, and, and, and having its, its vector potential be perpendicular to that so that the curl of that uh, comes out to be a constant. And so what you get is 1 plus the inertia that you'd be associated with if this thing was just a, 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 a hoop of radius r, but the actual inertia of a ball is uh, uh, 2 fifths m r squared. So we get 1 plus 1 over uh, 2 fifths. That comes out to be 7 halves. And that's, that's the, the bottom line on this device uh, right there. And I'll go ahead and put it on this screen uh, here. But um, let's see it in motion. So this is the thing that we want uh, to compare. If it's a solid ball, and that's what we've got on the table there, and will be in the video, uh, this inertia over mr squared is 2 fifths. Well, that makes this right here, the actual cyclotron frequency, to be 2 sevenths of omega. Well, that just means that this table, which has a little white mark on it, it's right there, uh, that's got to go around two times for every seven times the ball goes around its trajectory. That's what that is saying. That, I mean, it's like, it, you know, it's a geared, um, analog, but the ball is just doing what the ball does when it rotates on the table. So, um, without further ado, we play the movie. And you count the ball when I say zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It should have gone around twice. That's the thing to check uh, when you play with this uh, particular video here. Lots of other videos to play with. This is on YouTube, and then you get some ads with it. But, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, this is cool. Now, you notice that the circle has gotten a little bigger. That's because it's little imperfections in the ball and the table that are causing it uh, to, um, uh, you know, do that. Um, I will simply back out of this thing. Uh, here, but um, come back to it right now. Pause. Okay. So that is what I, one thing I want to show you. We only have a couple more minutes here. 
I do want to show you the very end of this thing, the, the punchline to this particular uh, situation with the uh, pool hall uh, setting their bumpers. Okay, and the idea is that if uh, the center of percussion, that's this, is above uh, where it's making a contact, then when it hits, it's going to kick this way. It's going to slide, and you don't want that. That messes up a, a bumper shot. All right, a good pool table will adjust that big H uh, just so that it matches. And it can't be the other way either. That is, if your center of percussion, that magic uh, 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 radius of P, uh, is uh, thing, that now when it hits, the ball's going to skid this way. You don't want any skidding. You want it to rotate around this point when it hits that. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's uh, you wouldn't think there'd be all that much physics at the local pool hall, but if it's a reputable house <laughs> of Ilriku, uh, it will have uh, done this a calculation. So that, that's the important thing that I wanted you to see. Okay, the rest of this will just be, uh, start this thing up and see if it'll actually do it for the real uh, thing. And I've got it pretty well balanced here. Now one of the things that you can do with this, and we're going to do it later when we talk about resonance in the cyclotron, is I can tip the table this way or that way uh, and that's like putting an electric field in this direction, either this direction or that direction. Okay. Anyway, let's see what uh, we can get going here. I'm going to crank it up to about 40. That's not 40 miles an hour, but it's 40 on this dial here. And I'm going to grab this ball, which is doing what it's supposed to do, but I'm going to put it in the center here, give it a little kick. And that's a cyclotron orbit. And actually, I can control uh, where it's headed by putting the electric field a little bit to bring it back toward me, toward you. Okay, by doing that. Now it's doing a, a curlate cycloid. I'm coming toward you. I turn it the other way, I can maybe before it goes off the edge, catch it and make it go the other way. Okay, I've got a tip so the electric field makes it. And you, you can hear it sort of catching on something, like a little dust particle makes a little a sound, even though you can't see it. Um, but if I bring this thing up to a fair speed here, it's surprising how well it'll hang on even though it's and then what's called parametric resonance is when I wiggle the, the field. That's something we'll talk about later on too. That's the modern way to do cyclotron resonance. There, it hit something that really made a sound. At some point, the static friction is going to break. That's it. Okay, the proton came out and, oh, I've got radiation for you. Okay, so anyway, this is something you can fool around with. It. I mean, in any time you want to. The, uh, it doesn't have to be a pool ball, actually. I find tennis ball isn't too bad, but it slips very quickly and gets the ball back into the... Uh, I planned that. <laughs> okay, anyway, that gives you uh, some feeling. And it doesn't matter that the ball uh, is a different size meant to pull out a ball bearing here that I had. I don't know what, what happened to it. I've got a whole bunch of balls. It, it, it's also fun to, uh, at a reasonable speed, go ahead and put um, two of them on here and give one of them a little different velocity and see if they run into each other. 
but the little the little ball, uh, if it's solid, will have the uh, same uh, frequency, two to seven. There now. Now they're dancing. We're all dancing the same music. A little bit of perturbations from collisions. That's yeah. That's what I was trying to get. Get them to to kiss. They don't stay kissed, but uh, sometimes it takes a while before they. I still can't find that ball bearing. I'll try this one. This should be the same. Whoops. You got hit right away. Oh, it's a champ. There you go, center. He's still dancing, right? They're in step. This one's two to seven as well. I'm bringing the electric field that way and I start to bring it out. Now if you can make a cheap one of these, people will buy it. I mean, they bought the Newton's balls, they ought to buy these balls, right? <laughs> Now I've got one left. Anyway, come, come up and fool around with it. We'll, we'll bring it up again when we talk about resonance, because there's where you see the phase and all that kind of stuff. I'm playing a role in getting energy into the uh, second level.